Welcome back. As we move to session 29, we'll be talking about the spiritual gift of mercy. We welcome all of you watching by DVD and we welcome back those of you in the classroom. In our last session, we talked about the spiritual gift of hospitality. And this is a gift that does not mean serving wonderful food, having a beautiful place setting, have an immaculate house. It is the person who creates an environment that makes people feel safe, makes them feel comfortable, secure, valued, and creates an environment where people talk about spiritual things. It is opening up your home to those who are believers and especially those who may be strangers or aliens in your area. I want to tell you a story about one of my best friends. His name is Del. His name's actually Del Mar, but he doesn't like that and goes by the name Del. He is one of the most godly men I know. I am proud that Del is my friend. I don't know too many people who have a more compassionate heart. Del has the gift of shepherding, he has the gift of giving, but he has the gift of mercy. And the story I'm about to tell you about Dell, I think is a wonderful example of someone exercising their gift of mercy and doing it with the love of Christ. Dell has been blessed by God with financial means. At one point in his life, he owned a business and he was quite wealthy. And he had put money aside to send all three of his children to college. And he had enough money that all three of them could go to college and he would pay in cash. That's quite a bit of money. And so Dell, as a wise steward, he decided to invest his money. And he knew a man who was a financial planner in his church. In my culture, there, is, there are people who come alongside those who are rich and they help them plan, how do I invest my money in order to be able to uh, make more money out of it by letting it uh, be invested in stocks and bonds and not just keep it in the bank where it gets very little return. Well, Dell knew this man from his church. He was quite confident in this man. The man had a great reputation for helping others increase their wealth. There was just one problem. This man was a criminal, and what he was doing was a scheme that we call a Ponzi scheme. And here's what it means. You take money from some people, and you invest a little of it, and you keep some money for yourself. Now, other people give you money. So you send some money to the people who first gave you money in interest. And then the second people, you keep a little for yourself, and you invest it. And as long as you keep having people give you money, you can keep things going. You get a little money. People are happy because they're getting a little money. They get statements each month that says, look how much money you've made. But it's only on paper. And eventually this man was caught. It was like a house of cards where you build a house with playing cards and it came crashing down. Dell lost all of his money. All of that hard-earned money that he had set aside for his children was gone. This man whom he had trusted, whom he had known for years, had taken his money and had kept it for himself, and he therefore cheated Dell out of all of Dell's money. This is where the story begins to show the gift of mercy. The criminal went to jail. Every week, Dell went to visit his friend in jail and sit with him and listen to him and to help him see that what he did was wrong, but it wasn't so wrong that God couldn't forgive him. He called him on the phone. He wrote him letters. He made sure that the man's family had money so that they didn't suffer. Imagine this. The very man who caused you to lose a fortune, now you are providing for his family to making sure 
that they don't suffer. And the man who was responsible for you losing your money, you're visiting him every week. The man who was the criminal eventually was released from prison and Dell gave him a job and helped to restore his respect and helped him to earn a living, helped him to get back on his feet and eventually to return to the church. And he was accepted by the congregation despite the fact that he had fallen very badly. That, my friends, is the gift of mercy. That is Jesus in action. I could never, ever have done that. I would have been so angry, so upset by this man who had taken all of my money that I think I couldn't have forgiven him ever. Not a very Christ-like attitude, but it would have hurt very badly. Dell, however, had the gift of mercy. He didn't do what ordinary human beings can do. This was extraordinary, supernatural power that allowed him to forgive and allowed him to bless and allowed him to restore this man who had hurt him so badly. The gift of mercy is a wonderful gift in action. And a story like Dell helps us to see that gift and how it blesses not only individuals but the entire church. Would you open to Romans chapter 12? We're back into a main passage that we've referred to often. And we're going back to the same verses that we've looked at before. But we're going to look at where the verse uh, with the gift of mercy appears and in what context. We're going to begin, as we have before, in verse 6. We'll continue until we come to the gift of mercy. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, which is helps, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. And if it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. In our last session, we talked about hospitality being a gift where you do it cheerfully, joyfully, you don't grumble. Mercy is the same kind of gift. You go to the hospital and you visit someone who is very sick. You don't do it because you feel a good Christian would do it. You go because you want to. You love that person and you go cheerfully and their spirits rise and it's because you showed mercy to them. If we would go to another verse in Matthew chapter 5, we'll come to a section called the Beatitudes. Now, it's not called the Beatitudes in the Bible. It's called the Beatitudes because of the verse, uh, the phrase that continually is used, blessed are the. The word blessed refers to beatitude, which means more than happy. So blessed are, more than happy are those who are poor in spirit. More are happy are those who mourn. More are than happy are those who meek. More than happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then in verse 7, blessed are the merciful. They are more than happy, for they will be shown mercy. In this one verse, we're told that there's a blessing for those who are sh show mercy to others. They receive mercy themselves in their time of need. And God loves those who show mercy, especially to widows and orphans and the lonely and the forgotten and those who are in prison. Those are the ones who God continually reminds us to show compassion for and who directs the hearts of those with the gift of mercy to go and serve. In the Greek, the word mercy in Romans 8 means elaleo, elaleo, and it's in Strong's G1653. And Strong says this is what it means, to have mercy on, 
makes sense, to help one afflicted or seeking aid. Afflicted means injured, who has been caused harm, who is suffering. And then finally, to bring help to the wretched. Mercy is where you go to the outcast, the ones who are the lowest of the low, the ones who have cheated you out of money and now they go to prison. How much lower can you go? I mean, probably can, but that's pretty low. In Strong's, it lists some synonyms related to mercy. It says, mercy is to feel sympathy with the misery of another. And it's more than just feeling bad for them. It's taking action to help them. It's not just feeling bad that Dell's friend went to prison. It's taking action. I'm going to go visit him. And by the way, the prison wasn't close by. It took Dell several hours each way to go to the prison. Sending letters, cards, helping his family, all of these go beyond just, I feel bad for you. You know, I really feel sympathy for your situation. You take action. You do something about it. It's having an inward feeling of compassion and a sense that I am in a position that I can help you. In Vine's Bible Dictionary, another Bible tool that's often used to understand words in the Greek, Vine's defines mercy this way, to show kindness through assistance. And that's what I mentioned before. You see, there's the feeling and then there's the act. This is going beyond just, I feel sympathy. I'm going to show you kindness. I'm going to assist you in your situation. Dell not only did all the things we talked about, he gave the man a job. He brought him right into his company where the man would be free to steal again. But Dell said to the man, I trust you. I really believe that you're a changed man and I'm going to hire you. That's taking action and that's assisting. Here's the definition that we're going to use. The definition is to help the afflicted, the poor, the lonely, and forgotten. To help the afflicted, the poor, the lonely, and forgotten. It's the woman who's lost her husband and she's in her 80s. And you go every week to help her get her groceries. You don't do it because you have to. You do it cheerfully. You want to. It's the person in a country without many resources. And you give them money and you give them time to go and help them rebuild their country. It's taking action. Someone has said that mercy is compassion moved to action. Now that might not translate into other languages with a rhyme, but in English, the word compassion and action have a similar rhyming sound to it. Compassion moved to action. All right, its purpose is to care for the hurting with acts of cheerful compassion. And once again, the role falls under the dominion of caring for the church. So many of these gifts are different facets of caring for people in need. The body was put together to bring us into a loving community where we help one another in our needs. And the gift of mercy are for those who are at their low point, for those who are beyond the point where they think anybody cares. There's no way that this man in prison thought anybody cares about me. How could they care about me? You know, I've lost my family, I've lost my friends, I've lost my reputation. And yet, Dell cared enough to help that man rebuild his life. 
He was the lowest of the low, but Dell showed him mercy. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. The gift mix that's associated with uh, the gift of mercy typically includes shepherding, which is the gift that is Dell's lead gift, the gift of encouragement, and the gift of helps. Those three gifts often cluster around mercy. You're a shepherd, you're responsible for a group of people in the body of Christ, you see someone in need and you show them mercy. You see somebody wandering from the faith, you go and help them, they're struggling dearly, you show them mercy. Uh, the woman needs to have uh, her grass mowed, you go and mow it, the gift of helps, and you do it cheerfully. Commentators have said, Carl Westerlin, it's helping those in distress with cheerfulness. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, which we've used in previous sessions, places the emphasis on the person's attitude. Whether they're doing it cheerfully, whether they're doing it without grumbling, whether there's joy associated in the action. And these are persons who use the little phrase, it's more blessed to give than receive. Theirs is, it's more blessed to help than to help, be helped. They want to take action to help those in need. Ministry tools, the internet resource, they have wonderful definitions for these and this one falls in that group. They said it's being sensitive towards those who are suffering, whether it's physically, mentally, or emotionally, so as to feel genuine sorrow with their misery. And it's more than speaking words of compassion, but caring for them with deeds of love to help them alleviate their distress. Once again, compassion moved to action. I want you to think as a visual aid, the Red Cross symbol. Now, as I've walked around the city where we're taping this, it's been very helpful for me to notice that uh, all of the drug stores, the place where you can buy medicine and get prescriptions, they all have the Red Cross symbol. Since I can't re read this language, I can tell by the sign this is a place where I can get help. The person with the gift of mercy is wearing an armband that has the Red Cross on it. Think of that visual and they are ready to go into action. The Red Cross is the international symbol for those who need help, help in the time of disaster. A hurricane strikes, a typhoon, an earthquake, uh, a famine, and the Red Cross is there. They go and they help and they provide for whatever medical needs might be needed, whatever sorts of uh, food and medicine might be needed. Whatever's required in the situation, the Red Cross goes and they make sure that people who are in distress, that their distress is alleviated by help. They're known throughout the world as people of compassion who will come to help those in need. A building burns down, families are out of a home, they have no one in the city to go live with. The Red Cross will give them a place to live. This is the idea of mercy. And there is one story, one story in the Bible, one parable that best captures the gift of mercy. I wonder if you can guess what that story is. Hmm? It's the Good Samaritan. And let's go to that uh, verse uh, section in Luke 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. It is a much loved parable. 
And it is a parable that captures the very essence of the spiritual gift of mercy. Beginning at verse 25, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But the man wanted to justify himself, so he asked, And who is my neighbor? And now Jesus tells the parable. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went down to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. A wonderful story capturing the very essence of the gift of mercy. There are some interesting things associated with this particular parable. Notice that the uh, expert in the law says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We know there's nothing you can do to inherit eternal life. It's not about your deeds. It's about your heart that you have admitted, I am a sinner. There's no way I can pay the price for my sin. I need a Savior. And Jesus, you're the only one who could do it. I can't. So he automatically begins from the wrong point of view. He's looking for, okay, point one, here's what you do. Point two, this way. Do all those things and you're in heaven. All right. But he does come back with a good reply. He does get it that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. In other versions of that little phrase, it's Jesus who says it. So perhaps Jesus said it those times Either this man had heard it said, had heard through the grapevine it had been said, or had come to this conclusion himself. But he parrots words that, he mimics words that Jesus had said. Jesus said, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. Again, nobody can love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Every moment of every day throughout your entire life, you'll fall short, which is the essence of sin. And you can't love your neighbor as yourself. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year throughout your life. You can't do it. And so Jesus, in a sense, is both affirming, yeah, you could do it that way, but you're going to fall short. He says, okay, do this and you'll live. Now look at the parable itself. It's got some interesting things in it. First, man's going down to Jerusalem. He's going to Jericho. Robbers beat him up, take his money. And then a priest, a Levite, one of the epitome of Jewish religion comes, sees the man. What does he do? Walks by on the other side. All right. A Levite 
came, saw the man, did the same thing. But then a Samaritan went to help. Why did Jesus pick a Samaritan? Well, Samaritans were looked down upon by uh, the Jewish nation. They were considered uh, outcasts from the Jewish people. And the, the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. They never associated with them. And yet this Samaritan goes from a man who's come down from Jerusalem. The implication is he's Jewish. And he comes and he sees the man. And unlike the people who are Jewish who should have stopped to help, he does. And not only does he help, look what he does. He puts him on his own donkey, which means I got to walk, right? After taking care of his immediate medical needs, he takes him to a hotel, an inn, and he stays an extra day. Because it says, the next day he took out two silver. He stayed overnight to make sure the guy was okay. Then he pays the bill, and then he says, and if anything else is owed, put it on my account and I will pay it. He went over and above. This is the gift of mercy. And Jesus has told a wonderful parable for us to understand. Unless the Spirit is with you, there's no way you can do this. By our human nature, we wouldn't go to this extent over and above the call of duty, what Jesus calls the extra mile. Few of us would do that, but empowered by the supernatural power of the Spirit, we certainly would. Well, once again, I want to give you a personal example out of my life. And this one also includes my mom. And she died of cancer at age 74. It's actually a, a story that has uh, a wonderful blessing for my brothers and myself as she looked up and blessed us and said, I love you, and then died and went to be with the Lord. But I've told you about the American Red Cross, the International Red Cross, Red Cross in many nations. There's another organization that has my heartfelt appreciation, deepest respect, and it's called hospice. Hospice are people who come alongside those who are dying and they care for them in their final hours. They mop their brow when it's perspiring. They hold their hand. You know, they care for them with medication, with food. They talk with them and sometimes hold them. I watch these hospice workers showing mercy to my mom. And I thought, I will be sure to support this organization because these people are the epitome of showing mercy. You could not do this job apart from having the gift of mercy. And most of the hospice workers I have met are Christians who, through this power of the Spirit, go and take care of people in their final hours and usher them from this world into the next. It's a wonderful organization. And for those of you who are hospice workers, I really salute you. You are wonderful people doing an important task. Here are some questions. Ask them of yourself. See if perhaps you have the gift of mercy. Has God worked through you to, one, take care in a joyful way of the sick, the hurting, the lonely, the forgotten, the dying. Two, to feel the pain of others and to want to do something to help them. Or three, has God worked through you to go the extra mile to help people who are hurting? If God has not put you in that position, is it something that resonates with you? Does your heart feel drawn to it? Because perhaps it's a gift that's buried and a gift that could have come out if you allowed yourself to be in those situations. Well, the gift of mercy has touched my life. I'm sure it's touched yours as well. And we're grateful that it's a gift that God's given to people in the body of Christ. Next time, we'll continue our journey as we look at spiritual gifts. We're continuing to look at gifts of the heart. And the next one will be shepherding. 
So please join us then.